They called it Trinity. July 16, 1945, in a remote desert near Los Alamos, New Mexico. The atomic age is born. Some scientists weep openly. Others are triumphant. Secretary of War Henry Stimson receives a cryptic message. It reads, Child is born. Its cries could be heard at my farm, and the light in his eyes seen at yours. The atomic bomb is the culmination of the Manhattan Project, one of the largest, most secretive, and most expensive undertakings by any government in history. Employing more than 200,000 people, it was formed by some of the greatest scientists of the age. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu, is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Three weeks later, a squadron of bombers leaves for Hiroshima. Upon departure, a pilot named Major Sweeney described seeing the most beautiful sunrise he has ever witnessed, a great big red ball of fire coming out of the ocean to the east. He would later describe the atomic bomb in similar terms. It looked like a boiling up with every color of the rainbow. As dark clouds formed overhead, sticky black rain began to fall. It was later understood that the rain itself was radioactive. Three days after Hiroshima, another atomic bomb was dropped. This on Nagasaki by Major Sweeney himself. At 10.58, the morning of August 9th, the bomb was exploded above the city and in the towering mushroom, Japan could read its doom. This was more than a routine bombing. It was the funeral pyre of an aggressor nation. Now back to This Is Your Life, Reverend Kiyoshi Tanimoto in Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. Time is standing still as our Earth shakes to an explosion never before equaled. Now you've never met him, I've never seen him, but he's here tonight to clasp your hand in friendship. Captain Robert Lewis, United States Air Force, who along with Paul Tibbetts piloted the plane from which the first atomic power was dropped over Hiroshima. <laughs> Captain Lewis, come in here close, and would you tell us, sir, of your experience on August 6, 1945? As I said before, Mr. Edwards, I wrote down later, my God, what have we done? For many around the world, the attacks were more than justified. They were comeuppance for the brutal atrocities committed by Imperial Japan throughout Asia. Yet as in Japan's own wars, civilians were forced to pay the largest price. the iconography of the new weapon would take on bizarre and ghoulish proportions. Admiral Spike Blandy and his wife celebrated the detonation of a thermonuclear device at Bikini Atoll with an atomic bomb, Cake. A high school in Richland, Washington adopted the A-bomb as their official mascot. Church artists carved images of the Enola Gay and other World War II bombers in stained glass windows. If the euphoria has faded over time, the rationale remains the same. 
the nuclear option was the lesser evil. Though the attacks killed hundreds of thousands of civilians, the alternative was far worse. A ground invasion would have taken millions of lives, both Japanese and American. This view is no longer tenable. The United States' own strategic bombing survey of 1946 states unequivocally that Japan would have surrendered even if the atomic bombs had not been dropped, even if Russia had not entered the war, and even if no invasion had been planned or contemplated. The National Archives in Washington chart Japanese peace overtures from as early as 1943. And a cable sent on May 5, 1945, by the German ambassador in Tokyo and intercepted by the U.S., reveals that the Japanese were desperate to sue for peace, including capitulation, even if the terms were hard. They're going to destroy Japan's armies, Japan's navy, Japan's air forces, Japan's war factories, Japan's whole power to wage war. Far from being frightened of Japanese belligerents, U.S. Secretary of War Henry Stimson told President Truman he was fearful the Japanese would surrender before the new weapon could show its strength. In his diary, he frankly explained a different reason for the assault. The bombs were dropped, in Stimson's words, to persuade Russia to play ball. Together, Hiroshima and Nagasaki constitute not only the most violent act of warfare in history, but also the most violent example of the psychological operation. Terrorism, in the, you know, in the broadest definition, is any act that targets civilians rather than military, although some terrorist acts do target military, but generally it's, it's conceded to be uh, targeting of civilians and noncombatants with the purpose of uh, de defeating a society. And there's a great deal of state violence against people that they are considered enemies of the state that could be considered and should be considered terrorism. However, the states define terrorism as acts of uh, either asymmetrical warfare where a less armed and capable group is trying to have some influence, might even be self-defensive, and using terrorist tactics in order to, uh, to dissuade. I mean, the, I think the human community avoids violence as much as possible uh, because of our, our memory of violence. And when you choose violence, you're not only harming the person you're choosing as the enemy, you're harming yourself. And I think the human community knows that lesson. So people will put up with a great deal of abuse before they go to violence. So many things are, are called terrorism, um, and many terrorist acts are, are exempted. However, if people get to a point of despair or hopelessness, uh, and they feel that there's no other way out and all other options have been tried, then a small segment of them will, will win by arguing for violence. And for a period, they'll get sanctuary and sanction and support out of the larger group for the violence. But once you restore justice and restore hope, then those people are no longer given that sanction and support. And um, that's really the only way out of the cycle, to respond to terrorism with counterterrorism and violence in the end only creates more victims and more anger. So terrorism is one of these concepts, one of these terms, that's obviously very important at the moment uh, to elites in the West. Uh, that uh, with the Cold War being over, it's pretty much consensus uh, that this is going to be the thing that's going to replace it, the war on terror, global war on terror, blah, blah, blah. And so you have to define terrorism obviously very carefully. It has to be something that only they do, and that we don't do, and that takes some pretty fancy footwork. The way the term is generally used is something like shock and awe.
when it's carried out by non-state, low-tech groups. So, in other words, uh, elites in the West would prefer that terrorism be something done generally by non-state groups, though it can be backed by terror states, it can be backed by enemy states. But generally, they want to avoid the idea of terrorism being attached to states. Even in the axis of evil, I think as a whole, they would prefer that these evil states sponsor terrorism. The notion that states can inherently be terroristic and use terroristic uh, methods is kind of dangerous, because then it might come back to haunt us. So generally non-state, generally low-tech. You know, and blowing yourself up in the marketplace and so on is pretty low-tech too. Uh, I said it was a form of shock and awe. What I meant by that is that um, when we use the word terrorism, we generally refer to an act of extreme violence, uh, which is meant to shock. It's not as if it shocks accidentally. It's meant to shock. It's meant to create awe and, of course, fear, terror, extreme fear, and therefore to intimidate populations. The bombers took off from the Hornet in the early morning of the 18th of April, 1942. They were about to fly into history. But first they set course for the Japanese mainland. The bombing of Tokyo dealt a huge psychological blow to the Japanese. And the man who had masterminded and led the raid was the then Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. In 1954, World War II General Jimmy Doolittle sent a secret report to President Eisenhower. Speaking of the Cold War, he stated, Hitherto acceptable norms of human conduct do not apply. If the United States is to survive, long-standing American concepts of fair play must be reconsidered. It may become necessary that the American people be made acquainted with, understand, and support this fundamentally repugnant philosophy. It would not be until the Vietnam War that the American people would become acquainted with the repugnant philosophy being promoted behind the scenes. In the immediate post-World War II era, most of the public would be shielded from the carnage committed in their name by a compliant and compromised news media. Yet hidden behind the facade of consumerism and nuclear family values was a relentless struggle over the issues of race, sex, and class. It would not only erupt in the homeland, but on a global scale, leading to the deaths of millions of people at the hands of an increasingly powerful and increasingly paranoid security apparatus. regimes which at the moment are abusing human rights, political murder, torture, deportations, imprisonment without trial, using the techniques they may have learned in this establishment. Uh, you may be right. If you can say that the skills which we've taught here have been applied, I can't deny that. Throughout the Cold War, the School of the Americas functioned as the primary training ground for the teaching of terrorism. Based in Fort Benning, Georgia, the SOA, which is now known as WINSEC, has trained more than 60,000 Latin American soldiers and policemen since its inception in 1946. Among its graduates are notorious dictators Manuel Noriega of Panama, Leopoldo Galteri of Argentina, and Hugo Benzer Suarez of Bolivia. 
It has a new name, but it's still known as the School of the Americas. There are numerous graduates of the School of the America, numerous, who have been involved in many of, of the worst acts of terrorism in the Western Hemisphere in the past 50 years or so. The classes on bomb making are called how to defuse a bomb. And it's the same with torture and assassination. You have to know how to assassinate to avoid of being assassinated yourself. So that, those are the covers. Torture techniques taught from rape to uh, derobing to torture with, with uh, pointed objects, breaking of uh, extremities, poking eyes out, branding. Most of the courses come around, revolve around what they call counterinsurgency warfare. Who are the insurgents? We have to ask that question. They are the poor. They are the people in Latin America who call for reform. They are the landless peasants who are hungry. They are health care workers, human rights advocates, labor organizers. They become the insurgents. They are seen as el enemigo, the enemy. And they are those who become the targets of those who learn their lessons at the School of the Americas. A lesser known training facility for both foreign and domestic military and intelligence personnel is Harvey Point. Described in official reports as an annex to the CIA training base at Camp Peary, Virginia. used to train anti-Castro Cubans for the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1960. The New York Times later reported that Harvey Point has trained 18,000 foreign intelligence operatives from 50 different countries. Among the individuals trained at the facility have been El Salvador's death squad chief, Roberto Dobison, Egypt's general intelligence directorate, Colombian counterinsurgency personnel, and Arab cadres, who would later join Osama bin Laden's forces fighting the Soviets in Afghanistan. According to former CIA officer Robert Baer, whose story was depicted in the Hollywood film Syriana, the two weeks of training at Point Harvey was, for all purposes, an advanced terrorism course. Among the techniques taught to new recruits is how to successfully install and remotely detonate a car bomb. Just north of the training facility is that of the mercenary group Blackwater, now known as Academi. These are children's drawings from El Salvador in the 1980s. The drawings are disturbingly similar to those of Palestinian children in the Israeli-occupied territories. In 2005, a number of media reports suggested that the Pentagon was debating the Salvador option for Iraq. According to the New York Times Magazine, the template for Iraq today is El Salvador, where a right-wing government backed by the United States fought a leftist insurgency in a 12-year war beginning in 1980. The cost was high. More than 70,000 people were killed, most of them civilians, in a country with a population of just 6 million. Most of the killing and torturing was done by the army and the right-wing death squads affiliated with it. Whole villages were targeted by the armed forces and their inhabitants massacred. 
As part of President Reagan's policy of supporting anti-communist forces, hundreds of millions of dollars in U.S. aid was funneled to the Salvadorian army, and a team of 55 special forces advisors, led for several years by Jim Steele, trained frontline battalions that were accused of significant human rights abuses. Using the doctrine of plausible deniability, few Americans were directly involved in the actual killing of Salvadorian civilians. This was not the case, however, in Vietnam. Operation Phoenix. This was a brainchild of uh, William Colby, who was at that time a senior CIA official in the U.S. occupied region of South Vietnam, later became director of the CIA. What they would do is the CIA would go out and use their contacts in various Vietnamese regions and say, okay, who are the Viet Cong, which are, uh, Viet Cong is a, a um, uh, derogatory term of that era, who are the Viet Cong in your neighborhood? And here, let me fill in this form of what you have to say. The forms go back to a data center. The data gets entered into the primitive computers as they existed in 1968, 9, 69, 1970. This is way before PCs. Get cranked through the computer. And out comes a list of people's names and their cousins' names, their wives' names, the kids' names. Well, is the kid over here in some other region that where he's getting turned in by somebody else? Bingo. Well, so the father and the kid, two regions, both getting turned in as alleged Viet Cong. Now what do we do? Well, we do two things. Um, sometimes they go and capture them and try to turn them into double agents. More often what they did is go and try to identify them and kill them. And by the agency's own accounting, at least 20,000 people were killed in this fashion. And it got to be where it was like someone would say, okay, you know, you come stay on my farm, and you can go hunting every day for free, and I'll give you all the ammo you want. And uh, you can hunt, and there's no limit. And you can go all go out together and just hunt, you know. And this one, it was like a hunting trip. And uh, the more people we killed, the happier our officers were, you know. It got to be like a game. Like, the object was to see who could kill the most people. And uh, the different ways you could prove how many people you killed would be like cutting off ears. Now, if you brought back someone's ears, you know, pretty likely you had to kill them to get them. And then people would... You know, whoever had the most ears, they would get the most beers, and you trade your ears for beers. That's a style of warfare that has, in new, in new forms, been picked up in Central America. The U.S. intervention in Nicaragua and El Salvador. In Nicaragua, it wasn't a direct in intervention. They didn't send in the Marines. What they did is they hired a proxy force called the Contras. In El Salvador, again, they didn't send in the Marines. What they did was uh, sponsor a, a political faction in that country's government and in that country's military. Equipped them with these tools. Basically the same uh, framework of, of collecting rumors about people, compiling the rumors, cross-referencing the rumors, and then using that to support death squads. Today, you got the same situation in Afghanistan. You got the same situation it was a major part of this so-called surge in Iraq.
the victims became known as desaparecidos. The first desaparecidos, which means uh, people who disappeared that had been documented began in, in, in Guatemala in the 1950s, whereby the state mobilized its resources to kidnap people, usually in the middle of the day, in the streets, in schools, uh, workplace, who were believed to have communist or uh, socialist um, ideology or just to sympathize with you know, organizations who were perceived to be communist. in the mid-80s that I coined this phrase, the third, third World War, because in my research I realized that we were not attacking the Soviet Union and the CIA's activities. We were attacking people in the third world. And I'm going to just quickly, in the interest of time, just give you a little sense of what that, uh, what that means, this third world war. Uh, basically, it's the third, I believe, in terms of loss of life and human destruction, the third bloodiest war in all of history. They undertake to run operations in every corner of the globe. Uh, they also undertook the license of operating uh, just totally above and beyond U.S. laws. They had a license, if you will, to kill, but also they, they took that to a license to smuggle drugs, a license to do all kinds of things to other people in other societies in violation of international law, our law, and every principle of nations working together for a healthier and more peaceful uh, world. Meanwhile, again, they battled to convert the U.S. legal system in such a way that it would give them control of our society. Now, we have massive documentation of what they call the secret wars of the CIA. We don't have to guess or speculate. We had the Church Committee investigate them in 1975, gave us our first really in-depth, powerful look inside this structure. Senator Church said in the 14 years before he did his investigation that he found they had run 900 major operations and 3,000 minor operations. And if you extrapolate that over the whole period of the 40-odd years that we've had a CIA, you come up with 3,000 major operations and over 10,000 minor operations. Every one of them illegal, every one of them disruptive of the lives and societies of other peoples, and many of them bloody and gory uh, beyond comprehension almost. played a key role in helping other governments pick their police intelligence agencies, including, we've learned, the Korean CIA, Uruguayan National Police. Can you tell us about this? No. If he appeared in a Hollywood thriller, he would be called a serial killer with sadistic personality disorder. As it happened, he worked for the State Department. Dan Mitrioni has become the poster child for American torture during the Cold War. Head of the Orwellian named Office of Public Safety in Montevideo, Uruguay. He was so enthusiastic about torture that he gave live demonstrations. His MO was to kidnap homeless people off the streets and demonstrate torture techniques to a rapt audience of military officials. Reportedly, four homeless men died as a result of Mitrioni's demonstrations. Former Uruguayan Chief of Police Intelligence Alejandro Otero explained that Mitrioni had instituted torture as a matter of routine, 
Among Mitrioni's recommendations were the adoption of new psychological techniques, such as playing a tape in the next room of women and children screaming, while informing the prisoner that the voices belonged to those of his family. In some cases, no recording was necessary. An investigation by the Uruguayan Senate concluded that during the US-backed reign of terror, pregnant women were subjected to various brutalities and inhumane treatment, while certain women were imprisoned with their very young infants and subjected to the same treatment. Similar patterns emerged across the globe. In Guatemala, a Roman Catholic nun named Diana Ortez was raped and tortured in the presence of an American consultant. For 24 hours, she was tortured and gang raped. During her ordeal, she identified the leader of the gang as a fellow citizen of the United States. I, I came out a totally um, different person. but also with new eyes and more attuned to the hurting, the brokenness, the, the oppression, the deceit of my government. I've heard people say that what happened in Avo Grape is an isolated incident. And I have to just shake my head and say, you know, are we on the same planet? You know, aren't you aware of our history? You know, isn't history taught in the classroom about you know, the role of the U.S. government in human rights violations? Just as they had done with the tactic of assassination, the CIA was good enough to provide a manual for their proxy forces on the use of torture. Widely known as Kubark, the title is actually a Cold War kryptonym for the CIA itself. One passage states, Deprivation of stimuli induces regression by depriving the subject's mind of contact with an outer world, and thus forcing it in upon itself. As the interrogate slips back from maturity toward a more infantile state, his learned or structured personality traits fall away. Dan Mitrioni was eventually kidnapped and killed by rebel forces. Incredibly, he was not tortured in turn. After his death, Mitrioni was declared an American hero. A benefit for his wife included performances by Frank Sinatra and Jerry Lewis. Decades later, the television show 24 would immortalize one of Mitrioni's innovations, pretending that a man's loved ones were being tortured in an adjacent room. Once again, the torturer would be cast as a hero, but in this case, no cover-up of his activities was necessary. Jack Bauer was a hero precisely because he was willing to engage in the most despicable act of which a human being is capable. In 2012, the propaganda of torture would reach its peak. I'm not your friend. I'm not going to help you. I'm going to break you. Any questions? Zero Dark Thirty, a collaborative project between the CIA and Academy Award-winning filmmaker Catherine Bigelow, falsely indicated that torture had been responsible for locating Osama bin Laden. Upon its release, 
even acting CIA director Michael Morell, was forced to admit that the film creates the strong impression that the enhanced interrogation techniques that were part of our former detention and interrogation program were the key to finding bin Laden. That impression is false. Torture is something that I never thought that uh, I would be very much interested in or involved in. It's strange credulity that we should be discussing whether torture should be uh, allowed or encouraged by our government. Um, about six, seven years ago, uh, a radio producer uh, called me up and said, Mr. McGovern, we're going to have a little colloquium on torture, 20 minutes, 10 for you, we know where you stand on torture, and 10 for uh, one of the advocates of torture, for the other side. And I said, for the other side? He said, oh yeah, there's somebody who thinks that torture is, you know. I said, there's another side? Ever? Well, I wanted to say, well, bring them on, you know, but that's already been used, I don't want to use that. So when I got off the phone, I said to myself, Ray, I guess, you know, get over your shock, man. Some, some people really think it's okay. So take some, take 10 minutes out. He's gonna call back in 10 minutes. Figure out what you're gonna say about torture. It gives the country a bad name. It endangers our own troops. It brutalizes people. And you know, all you need to do, it brutalizes people. You know, what, all you need to do is talk to people coming back from Abu Ghraib as I have, and you'll see that not only were those tortured, brutalized, but the people who were ordered or permitted or encouraged to do the torture were also brutalized. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know, torture doesn't work. And what was really, really telling was that when George Bush decided to make his big speech, on September 6, 2006, advertising the merits of what he called an alternative set of procedures, read harsh interrogation techniques, okay? On that very day, the head of Army Intelligence, Admiral John, Kim, I'm sorry, General John Kimmons, decided he'd have his own press conference in the Pentagon, and he released what was the new Army Manual on torture, okay? You know what he said? This is a direct quote. No good intelligence has ever come from harsh interrogation techniques. History has proved this, and the empirical experience of the last five years, comma, hard years, comma, have also proved this, end quote. If torture does not produce reliable intelligence, as all credible experts insist, the question remains as to why governments bother to use the tactic at all. One possible answer is that torture is a highly effective method of eliciting fake confessions that serve to justify state policy. Omar Suleiman, who served as Egypt's torturer-in-chief for U.S. rendition programs, managed to extract a confession by even Sheikh al-Libi that Iraq was linked to al-Qaeda operatives and that they were training in the deployment of chemical and biological weapons. And we believe he has, in fact, reconstituted nuclear weapons. No question we have said that Saddam Hussein possesses biological and chemical weapons. We know where they are. They're in the area around uh, Tikrit and Baghdad. Later, a child soldier named Omar Qadir, originally hailing from Canada, would be convicted by so-called evidence obtained through torture. The events have a disturbing historical parallel. The show trials of the Soviet Union portrayed hapless former party officials admitting to counter-revolutionary activities, confessions obtained through torture. Slansky was charged with Titoism, spying and sabotage. His confession was fiction, drafted by Soviet advisers. 
To tedy znamená, že na začátku své politické činnosti před orgány buržázní moci jste si vedli jako oportunista a zbabělec a ne jako komunista. Je to tak. Jaký to řetěz otřásajících zločin. Avšak přes rafinované spiklenství a záškonicí, přes stivou obojetnost a hanebnost svých prostředků nedosáhli si. Another answer to the question of why torture is practiced is that it is itself a form of terrorism. There have been societies in the past, of course, and still some today, which practice torture regularly and don't particularly hide it. It's just part of how the state carries out its functions. And there are also non-state societies that have used it. And it has various purposes. One of them is to intimidate, usually, and and, and to, to give the message to people, this is who we are and this is what we can do to you. And the narrative of freedom, you know, that the U.S. not only treasures freedom for its own people, but is also uh, the liberator of other people. So it goes to Afghanistan to liberate Afghan women and, and the population in general from repressive uh, autocratic fundamentalists. Right? And it goes to Iraq because this, this tyrant is there and so on. So this is a liberation narrative. It's a narrative of benevolence. And it's very dangerous, therefore, to have too much of this overt massacre and torture happening. And yet there's always been, along with the this liberator narrative, a kind of secondary narrative a little bit, just a little bit in the wings. A little bit repressed, but very much there. And that's the old one that war makers insist on. I mean, it's part of their power. And it is the same one that I mentioned before. This is who we are, and this is what we can do to you. What I see happening now is a shift I see that the narrative that was in the background somewhat before is now moving to the foreground. So yeah, we knew they were training tortures, the School of the Americas, and that the U.S. was implicated in all this stuff, but there was, they were always trying to say, no, 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 we, we're one step removed. These guys are out of control. You know, we wouldn't directly get our American hands dirty. We don't do the wet work. I think it's an important shift, and I think it shows the cracks that are developing in, in the Imperium here. That we don't have legitimate institutions, we don't have the love and affection, the trust, we don't have the credibility, we don't have any of those things that most government aspire, governments aspire to have. Therefore, we must rule through naked aggression and by inducing fear in you. And that is what the U.S. is starting to resort to. Now, that's very tricky because it's pretty well known that your that these acts of for example torture when you torture people and you drop bombs on them when you do shock and awe on them it even this is even recognized by the way in shock and awe documents military documents they recognize this you can induce obedience and awe and fear and, and so on but you can also induce resistance disgust revulsion anger and uprising and this is the danger you always take. This is the danger that all tyrants court when they try and rule through naked fear. It's very fragile. Their power is very fragile. As it turns out, World War II General Jimmy Doolittle's memo to President Eisenhower, claiming that the U.S. would have to abandon traditional American notions of fair play, was based more on myth than reality. Notably absent from most mainstream histories of the United States, though not military manuals, is the concept of total war. According to this strategy, attacks against civilians and their infrastructure are not only fair game, they are a vital component of the war effort as a whole. In the United States, total war was employed against indigenous populations, with genocidal results. Similar techniques would also be adopted against Filipinos, in the late 19th century. During the 20th century, 
new technologies would permit a new and monstrous efficiency in the targeting of civilians. After five years of killing, the gears of the Vietnam death machine were grinding more slowly in the months before the invasion of Cambodia. Almost all restraint is off. For the first time, the Vietnamese are seeing the holocaust of conventional war, the kind that leveled much of Korea and destroyed dozens of cities in World War II. Women, children, babies. Some are dead, some are not dead. By evening, government spokesmen are saying another grand victory has been won in Quang Tri province. The situation is once again stabilized. But there will be more fighting and more words. Words spoken by generals, journalists, politicians. But here on Route 1, it's difficult to imagine what those words can be. There's nothing left to say about this war. There's just nothing left to say. Bob Simon, CBS News, Route 1. In the wake of Vietnam, American policy planners were faced with a problem. It was called the Vietnam Syndrome and related to a widespread disgust by American citizens over the mass slaughter committed in their name. Now, the problem for uh, Reagan was twofold. We had just come out of the Vietnam War and public opinion in the United States was overwhelmingly opposed to U.S. military interventions abroad, mainly because of the high loss of lives and the hundreds of thousands of wounded American soldiers and the traumatic experiences they had. What uh, some uh, commentators call the Vietnam Syndrome, that Washington uh, should refrain from military operations outside of the territorial U.S. In order to reverse the Vietnam Syndrome, a new model developed. It involved an economic, rather than overt, conscription program, as well as intense media censorship of the casualties of war. The public would be taught that modern warfare was a clinical exercise, mostly devoid of civilian casualties, even as the opposite became true. Much of the misperception regarding civilian casualties owes to highly deceptive reportage by the media. What we really have is a, is a military-industrial media complex in the United States. And to say that is that there's been a concentration of media. When Project Censored started 32 years ago, there were 50 major media corporations in the United States, actually a little bit more, probably closer to 60. And in that time, we've come down now to 10 major companies. You know, you've got the five, the big television companies um, with the 24-hour news, MSNBC and Fox and CNN. And that's where most people are getting their news. So that's very limited. And then you've got the New York Times, Washington Post, you know, LA Times, Chicago Tribune are the big papers. It's, it's very concentrated and, and very narrow. We're 10 major companies now that, that dominate the news in the United States and are the suppliers of, of the ideas and the understandings that uh, the American people uh, have access to. The board of directors of the 10 big media groups could fit in a, in a medium-sized classroom, we're only talking about 120 people or so, and they all pretty much know each other. They in turn sit on the boards of directors of like 20% of the corporate 1,000. So they're on big corporation boards in addition to being on media boards. And what we've seen since 9-11 is a real penetration of, uh, from the military industrial companies, the military companies, the top ten, on the boards of directors of media firms. You've got this really in-depth penetration between the military companies, the ones that are so profitable since 9-11. I mean, we're seeing 300% increase in profits for Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, values of their stock. Um, that had, that occurred, and you know, literally capturing billions of dollars of of money, and because of war, and then having people right sitting on the boards of the big media companies. 
It is a 2,000 pound bomb uh, that is deadly accurate. Uh, and that is the thing that is allowing us, it allowed us in Afghanistan and will allow us in this next conflict to be terribly accurate, terribly precise, and terribly destructive. To see that uh, military targets are, are destroyed, to be sure. Uh, but that uh, it's done in a way and in a manner and in a destruct in a direction and with a weapon that is appropriate to that very particularized target. The weapons that are being used today have a degree of precision that no one ever dreamt of. Well, there's a saying, the first casualty of war is the truth, and that's true. Uh, you know, whether any country uses propaganda First of all, on its own citizens to get into a war and to make sure the public supports the war, and then on the enemy to defeat the enemy. And wars are filled with propaganda terms like friendly fire. I hate that term. I mean, what it means is we killed one of our own soldiers. Uh, friendly fire sounds like, you know, let's get out the marshmallows and the s'mores. Or uh, we now have bombs that are smart bombs. And so they don't cause collateral damage. What does that even mean, smart bombs and collateral damage? It means that when you're bombing Baghdad, you're killing civilians. There's no way around it. That's collateral damage. It sounds like something in an insurance policy. You know, it, it helps us not really think of what's going on. The idea of the military being able to show footage from a nose cone of some missile entering a window and blowing up a building, well, obviously that's a pretty smart bomb because it just went in there and got the bad guys. I mean, the bad guys is sort of a post-9-11 term that's right out of, you know, all the cowboy movies of the 20th century. The Lone Ranger was always after the bad guys. John Wayne was always out to get the bad guys. We're often led to believe that this is uh, another one of these binary systems, you know. Um, in other words, we, we have a choice. Killing is either intentional or it's unintentional. And unintentional means somehow accidental. That's what we're often being told by our leaders. And that terrorists do the first. They kill intentionally. And, and when I kill, say kill, I mean kill innocent people intentionally. Kill civilians and kids and stuff. And we, on the other hand, unfortunately sometimes, you know, do that, but it's always unintentional, it's accidental, it's not what we're really trying to do. And I think my response to that is twofold. In terms of intention, this is a false binary. And if you look at legal systems around the world, you find that um, they recognize that for some, for, to talk about murder, for example, most legal systems will say you have to have more than A, killing B, which is a physical act. You also have to have a certain mental state. In Latin, mens rea, and uh, means the guilty mind. And then, uh, and then there are discussions in, and, and distinctions and divisions in legal systems to what this guilty mind would involve. And it doesn't have to necessarily involve, you know, twirling your handlebar mustache and saying, I'm going to kill 500,000 kids in Iraq. But in our legal system, we recognize that there can be a guilty mind without that degree of intentionality. So there are concepts of criminal negligence. There are concepts of doing something knowingly rather than unknowingly. Concepts of recklessness. Concepts of so-and-so knew or should have known should have reasonably known that their action would cause this death. Uh, there are at least four levels of distinction in this idea of the guilty mind. And we should keep this in mind, because it isn't a question of either, on the one hand, twirling your handlebar mustache, or somehow it's an accident. There's all these possibilities in between. So, for example, if somebody says, well, my intention was not to kill anybody, I was hungry, there was a hot dog stand, I saw there was only one hot dog left, so I drove my hum Humvee there as quickly as I could. Yes, I ran over 18 people, you know, because there was a crowd in front of the hot dog stand, but my intention was not to kill people, it was to have a hot dog. Well, okay, try that one, you know, you'll end up in jail for quite a while. But the second thing I want to do is talk about actual military strategy. Some people still think that, oh, the, you know, the governments of the West would never 
do any kind of attack on civilians. Well, excuse me, that's very naive. Uh, since at least Clausewitz, who was a theoretician of war in the early 1800s, um, this idea of, I mean, Clausewitz had this notion of what he called centers of gravity. It's not enough to attack the army of your opponent. You know, in a modern industrial society, it may make at times much more sense to attack, for example, their centers of production, industrial production, or their centers of production of information and propaganda, or whatever. And he called these centers of gravity. And this idea of the COG, or center of gravity, is still very much alive in U.S., say, U.S. Air Force doctrine. And it's recognized that a society will have certain centers of gravity which must be attacked. You see this in the attacks on Iraq, let's say in 1991, where the uh, hydroelectric stations were targeted. They obviously were vital to the health of the society. They were vital to maintaining pure water, for example, the sewage system, water purification system. So when you talk about they only used precision guided munitions, the question is, yeah, but if they used them to knock out those mechanisms for maintaining health in the society, then obviously they're destroying that health, and they know they are. And they even talk about targeting it at times. A study called Iraq Water Treatment Vulnerabilities was produced for the U.S. military and the U.K. military. It is dated January, sometime January 1991, so the sanctions had been going on for some months, since August, against Iraq, but the actual armed attack hadn't quite yet begun. And the study concludes that Iraq's water purification system is in deep trouble because of the sanctions. The Iraq, the document says very clearly, uh, will not be able to repair these systems as long as the sanctions that now exist are in place. And it says uh, it's already in, in deep disrepair and it's going to get worse. And we can expect the following epidemic diseases to break out and then they, they list them. We know they received the document January 1991, so what did they do? Well, they attacked Iraq and they, they made water purification and sewage treatment even worse, much worse, in fact, than it had been when the document was written. They destroyed some of these systems directly, and in other cases rendered them inoperative indirectly through walk, uh, knocking out hydroelectric stations. And then they maintained this system in a hopeless state of disrepair for the next 10 years or so. So a reasonable estimate is that 500,000 kids in Iraq that would otherwise be alive died during that period. Not all from diarrheal diseases, but a substantial number. And it was known, and the study had been done, and oh, everything was in place now. So what do we do with that? Was there a group of military officers sitting around Washington, let's say, and saying, let's kill 500,000 Iraqi kids? Don't know. Probably not. But they were in full control of the situation, knew it was happening at every stage. So they did it knowingly. And they would certainly, uh, if this had been a domestic crime, be considered to have mens rea, you know, the guilty mind, and certainly be considered responsible. And to top it all off, we have a publication in which a U.S. military officer brags about the fact that they created, I think he calls it, a public health crisis in Iraq through these sorts of methods. So not only did we do it, not only did we know we were doing it, but we celebrate it. We regard it as a legitimate way of fighting war, despite the fact that, of course, it's against the Fourth Geneva Convention. This is what's being done. This is the kind of thing that's being done pretty regularly now through high-tech modern warfare by so-called democracies. And the actual agent of destruction may be a precision-guided missile. It doesn't matter if the point of it is to ruin the health of a population, a civilian population. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. 
and and you know is the price worth it i think this is a very hard choice but the price we think the price is worth it Closely related to the practices of torture and total warfare is the concept of demonstrative violence. In the Philippines, during the Hook insurrection, the CIA's Ed Lansdale would use brutal violence as a form of Psywar. A later U.S. Army Psywar pamphlet explicitly refers to Lansdale's techniques, advocating exemplary criminal violence, the murder and mutilation of captives, and the display of their bodies. In Indonesia, under various U.S.-backed dictatorships, the idea of demonstrative violence would again take on genocidal proportions. As a Psy War tactic, the bodies of men, women, and children were dumped in rivers and kept afloat as a warning to the population at large. To make sure they didn't sink, the carcasses were deliberately tied to or impaled on bamboo stakes. The rivers literally ran red with blood. Like psychological warfare itself, demonstrative violence is as old as civilization. One of the most brutal forms would also become the symbol of one of the world's great religions. Crucifixions were not only a means of torture and execution, but a demonstration to other would-be rebels. In this clip, from a documentary on Alexander the Great, Colonel Lance Betros discusses the power of demonstrative violence. Alexander's attitude toward defiance was either join me or die. Alexander begins what would become the longest and most brutal siege of his campaign. After seven grueling months, when the walls are finally breached, 7,000 Tyrians are killed and 30,000 enslaved. To prove a point to other cities that might resist, he has 2,000 Tyrian fighters crucified. When he was finished, he allowed the bloodlust of his men to run loose and killed every, virtually every male inhabitant of the, of the fortress. Um, it, was, it was an awful display of, of brutality, but it was also very effective in showing to any other potential enemies what could happen if they resisted. Just as Alexander made an example of Tyre, the American army would make an example of Fallujah. On March 31st, 2004, four mercenaries working for Blackwater USA were captured and killed by the Iraqi resistance and their bodies dragged through the streets. What followed was one of the greatest war crimes in modern history. Sealing off Fallujah and forcing adult males and teenage boys to remain, over half of the entire city was razed to the ground. We were told going into Fallujah, into the, the combat area, that every single person that was walking, talking, breathing was an enemy combatant. As such, every single person that was walking down the street or in the house was a, a target. Wissen Sie, dass gerade dieser Panzer hier radioaktiv ist? 
Nein, da ist nichts, sagt der Soldat. Überhaupt nichts. Aber wir haben es gemessen. Nein, er ist nicht radioaktiv. Dieser Panzer sowieso nicht. Er ist mit Uranmunition abgeschossen worden. Sorry, ich muss jetzt weitermachen. Just as the spraying of Agent Orange in Vietnam would lead to an explosion in cancer rates and birth defects, the use of white phosphorus and other munitions have produced similar results in cities like Fallujah. A study from July 2010 showed a 12-fold increase in childhood cancer in the city. It also reported that an incredible 14.7% of children are now born with birth defects more than 14 times the figure recorded for Hiroshima. In a grim irony, shortly after the Fallujah study was released, Wired magazine revealed that the US military was teaching its officers at the Joint Forces Staff College to use Hiroshima tactics and wage a total war on Islam. Arabs who resist occupation with armed self-defense or conversely, adopt the tactics of their oppressors by engaging in acts of terrorism are widely portrayed as being motivated by religion. Yet an actual study of the subject came to the opposite conclusion. The study was conducted at the University of Chicago's Project on Security and Terrorism. Among other revelations, it revealed that more than 95% of all suicide attacks are in response to foreign occupation, not religion. Bachmann and four of her Republican colleagues are demanding an investigation into potential infiltration by Muslim Brotherhood operatives intent on destroying Western civilization. Containing dangerous Muslims, that is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. It's a frightening thought, Islamic terrorist training camps right here in America in our backyards. So we made it through the holidays without a terrorist attack, but it doesn't mean we can ever let our guard down because our enemies are persistent and they're patient. Could the hundreds of mosques in America be fronts for terror training? Not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslims. It's a, there's a menace to that. You've upset a billion of us, you should watch out. That's what it means. And we're going to try and move in to your city and your country, too, and we're going to raise more and more demands. That's what's meant by it. Would you grant me this, that as long as there is an Israel in the world, and I'm a big supporter of Israel, and as long as America backs it, the kind of Muslims that take their religion that seriously that they would strap on a suicide belt are always going to be out for us and always going to be trying to kill us. And the thing that worries me the most in the world is radical Islam, obviously, and increasingly, might I add, moderate Islam. The overarching narrative regarding Islam versus the West was given pseudo-intellectual justification by Samuel Huntington, a member of the elite Trilateral Commission, via his book, The Clash of Civilizations. It says a very brief and rather crudely articulated manual in the art of maintaining a wartime status in the minds of Americans and others, that Huntington's work has to be now understood. I go so far as saying that it argues from the standpoint of Pentagon planners and defense industry executives uh, who may have temporarily lost their occupations after the end of the Cold War but have now discovered a new vocation for themselves. But few people today with any sense would want to volunteer such sweeping characterizations as the ones advanced by Lewis about a billion, a billion Muslims scattered through five continents, dozens of differing languages and traditions and histories. Of them all, Lewis says that they are all enraged at Western modernity, as if a billion people were really only one person and Western civilization was no more complicated a matter than a simple declarative sentence. There's a similar debate inside the Islamic world today, which in the often hysterical outcry about the threat of Islam, Islamic fundamentalism and terrorism that one encounters so often in the media is often lost sight of completely like any other major world culture, Islam contains within itself an astonishing variety of currents and countercurrents. I would say that it is this extremely widespread attitude of questioning 
and skepticism towards age-old authority that characterizes the post-war world in both East and West. And it's that that Huntington cannot handle and therefore resorts to the business of the clash of cultures and the clash of civilizations. What is described as Islam belongs to the discourse of Orientalism, a construction fabricated to whip up feelings of hostility and antipathy against a part of the world that happens to be of strategic importance for its oil, its threatening adjacence to Christianity, its formidable history of competition with the West. Yet this is a very different thing than what to Muslims who live within its domain, Islam really is. There's a world of difference between Islam in Indonesia and Islam in Egypt. But the truly weakest part, and I conclude here, or the, weak, the weakest part of the clash of cultures and civilizations thesis is the rigid separation assumed between them, despite the overwhelming evidence that today's world is in fact a world of mixtures, of migrations, and of crossings over, of boundaries traversed. There are no insulated cultures or civilizations. Any attempt made to separate them into the watertight compartments alleged by Huntington and his ilk does damage to their variety, their diversity, their sheer complexity of elements, their radical hybridity. The more insistent we are on the separation of cultures, the more inaccurate we are about ourselves and about others. Our most precious asset in the face of such a dire transformation of history is the emergence, not of a sense of clash, but a sense of community, understanding, sympathy, and hope, which is the direct opposite of what Huntington provokes. The language of group identity makes a particularly strident appearance from the middle to the end of the 19th century as the culmination of decades of international competition between the great European and American powers for territories in Africa and Asia. In the battle for the empty spaces of Africa, the so-called dark continent, France and Britain, Germany, uh, Belgium, Portugal, resort not only to force, but to a whole slew of theories and rhetorics for justifying their plunder. Perhaps the most famous of such devices is the French notion of the civilizing mission, la mission civilisatrice, a notion underlying which is the idea that some races and cultures have a higher aim in life than others. This gives the more powerful, the more developed, the more civilized, the higher, the right to co colonize others, not in the name of brute force or plunder, both of which are standard components of the exercise, but in the name of a noble ideal. Conrad's most famous story, The Heart of Darkness, is an ironic, even terrifying enactment of this thesis that, as the narrator puts it, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. What redeems it is the idea, an idea at the back of it, not a sentimental pretense, but an idea, and an unselfish belief in the idea, something you can bow down before and sacrifice to. In response to this sort of logic, two things occur. One is that competing imperial powers invent their own theory of cultural destiny in order to justify their actions abroad. Britain had such a theory, Germany had one, Belgium had one, and of course in the concept of manifest destiny, the United States had one too. These redeeming ideas dignify the practice of competition and clash whose real purpose, as Conrad quite accurately saw, was self-aggrandizement, power, conquest, treasure, and unrestrained self-pride. The second thing that happens is that the lesser peoples, the objects of the imperial gaze, so to speak, respond by resisting their forcible manipulation and settlement. Pride of place in this practice is given to <coughs> compassion. And it is an arresting fact that right across the board, in every single one of the major world faiths, compassion, the ability to feel with the other, in the way we've been thinking about this evening, is the, not only the test of any true religiosity, it is also what will bring us into the presence of what Jews, Christians, and Muslims call God or the divine. Uh, it is compassion, says the Buddha, which uh, brings you to nirvana. Why? Because in compassion, when we feel with the other, we dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and we put another person there. 
Um, and uh, once we get rid of ego, then we're ready to see the divine. And in particular, every single one of the major world traditions has highlighted and has said at the, put at the core of their tradition what's become known as the golden rule. First propounded by Confucius five centuries before Christ, do not do to others what you would not like them to do to you. That, he said, was the central thread which ran through all his teaching and that his disciples should put into practice all day and every day. And it was uh, the golden rule would bring them to the transcendent value that he called ren, human heartedness, which was a transcendent experience in itself. And this is absolutely crucial to the monotheisms too. Uh, there's a famous story about the great Rabbi Hillel, the older contemporary of Jesus. A pagan came to him and offered to convert to Judaism if the rabbi could recite the whole of Jewish teaching while he stood on one leg. <laughs> Hillel stood on one leg and said, that which is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the Torah. The rest is commentary. And this is an important point, I think, that you could not and must not confine your compassion to your own group, your own uh, nation, your own co-religionists, your own fellow countrymen. You must have what one of the Chinese sages called Ryan Ai, concern for everybody, love your enemies, uh, honor the stranger. We formed you, says the Quran, into tribes and nations so that you may know one another. And uh, this, again, this universal outreach is getting subdued in the strident uh, use of religion, abuse of religion, for, uh, for, for, for nefarious gains. Make no mistake about it, uh, religion is a kind of fault line. And when a conflict gets uh, ingrained in a region, uh, religion can get sucked in and become part of the problem. Extremism is when I think you do not allow for a different point of view and when you hold your view as being quite exclusive. On August 18th, at the Ramada Hotel in central Jerusalem, leading Israeli rabbis gathered to defend the publication of a book by one of their peers that cited rabbinic sources to justify the killing of non-Jews, including innocent children and families. There is no salvation in hell. There's no savior in hell. There's no Bible in hell. There's no blood in hell. There's no altars in hell. There's no forgiveness in hell. Whatever goes to hell stays in hell. Satan, be gone. Like all religions, Islam has its share of extremists. Yet far from opposing such groups, the major Western powers have frequently supported them. The most notorious case remains Saudi Arabia, where people are routinely beheaded for crimes such as sorcery and witchcraft. In 2011, the Obama administration and the Saudis conducted the biggest arms deal in history. Islamic fundamentalists have consistently been empowered by the West, both as a divide-and-conquer stratagem and as a means of countering secular nationalist regimes, which threaten control of oil supplies. This has been seen most recently in the proxy wars against Syria and Libya, where NATO-backed Islamists have caused thousands of deaths. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, Sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, Well, you're too busy. He said, No, no. He says, We've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, We're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. 
He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. So go through the countries again? Well, starting with Iraq, then Syria and Lebanon, then Libya, then Somalia and Sudan, and then back to Iran. The United States would indeed attack Iraq, but the people of Libya and Syria would have to wait until the next administration to receive the gift of American democracy. Let's get it done. Let's arm these rebels. Let's give them a chance to fight. A sentiment also supported by MSNBC's most liberal talk show hosts, Rachel Maddow and Lawrence O'Donnell. It seems to me there's a practical, war-making, tactical uh, success that they believe they could have in this particular country. Exactly. He kept describing himself as sort of acutely aware of the risks and the costs of America doing any sort of military intervention. And so you're exactly right. I think we have to do it. It is a moral decision at this point. The headline from Reuters yesterday, President Barack Obama has signed a secret order authorizing U.S. support for rebels seeking to dispose Syrian President Bashar al-Assad and his government. A U.S. government source acknowledged that under provisions of the presidential finding, the United States is collaborating with a secret command center operated by Turkey and its allies. Last week, Reuters reported that along with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, Turkey had established a secret base near the Syrian border to help direct vital military and communication support to Assad's opponents. So what you need to know, late last year when Senator John McCain co-wrote the National Defense Authorization Act and President Obama signed it into law, they crafted a law that gave the president the authority to use all necessary and appropriate force during the current armed conflict with al-Qaeda and the Taliban and associated forces, including the power to indefinitely detain anyone caught supporting al-Qaeda, which in this case is the president and members of Congress. To be clear, we're spending over a trillion dollars and more importantly, spilling the blood of thousands of American lives in Iraq and Afghanistan, then spending more American money and military power to, in some cases, help the same fighters overthrow another government. For the most part, this began in a generic form from around the 1960s, really took off, where we had, in places like Egypt, institutions like the Muslim Brotherhood, which were founded with the covert uh, financial support of the CIA. And this is very well documented, it's not controversial anymore. And that doesn't mean that organisations like the Muslim Brotherhood from top down were simply kind of plants from Western intelligence services. On the contrary, there were movements inside Egypt which organically emerged as a result of struggles going on inside that country with you know, a combination of Western interference, secularization, the emergence of modernity, the struggle between kind of traditional and cultural ideas linked to Islam, the sense of grievance that occurred in terms of British colonization and the collapse of the Ottoman empire and the way in which Muslims kind of responded to that across these different regions. So all of these complex things are what gave rise to these very different types of thinking. But certainly, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood is an example where movements that were led by ideologues like Hassan al-Banna, for example, and Said Qutb, who I don't think there was any reason to think that these particular individuals were in any way kind of, say, plants, for example. But the ideas that they developed were given financial mobilization and infrastructural support in a way that probably wouldn't have been possible without um, the input of, of the United States and Britain and other Western European powers. In the Middle East, you find that these virulent Islamist movements were supported as a way of countering both independent nationalist movements, 
as well as movements that were kind of left-leaning. This whole process basically accelerated when the United States began to see Afghanistan as a major area of strategic influence. And Zbigniew Brzezinski, the former National Security Advisor to the Carter administration, as well as people like Robert Helms, former director of the CIA, have both admitted that they began intelligence interference and military intelligence operations in Afghanistan before the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Afghanistan was considered to be a gateway to Eurasia. And Eurasia itself was also considered to be the basis for maintaining US hegemony. If you controlled Afghanistan, you could control Eurasia. If you controlled Eurasia, you would control world order. And this is simply because of, again, population, resources, geographic position. So these are all very imperial considerations and Brzezinski actually articulates these ideas very candidly in his book, The Grand Chessboard. So this is why we kind of got involved in Afghanistan. But in the process, we funded, and by we I mean the United States, Britain, again, Western European powers, even elements of the Muslim world who were allies of the United States, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. We funded these virulent kind of marginal groups and then Afghanistan and Osama bin Laden was involved in this process. He had uh, connections with the CIA. He received funding from the CIA to facilitate the establishment of the Tora Bora complex, for example. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. This process continued throughout the post-Cold War period as a way of um, rolling back the Soviet Union, and it was paralleled again in the Middle East where funding of the same kinds of movements accelerated across the Middle East in order to basically, again, roll back the Soviet influence, but potential left-leaning interference in all of these countries. In 1958, uh, President Eisenhower expressed an internal discussion, since declassified, concern about what he called the campaign of hatred against us uh, in the Arab world, uh, not by governments, but by the people. Uh, the National Security Council explained same time. Uh, the reasons for it, this is the highest planning body, uh, they said there's a perception in the Arab world that the United States supports uh, dictatorships and blocks democracy and development, uh, and that uh, we do that so as to ensure control over uh, the resources of the region. And furthermore, they went on to say that the perception is basically accurate, and uh, that that's exactly what we should be doing relying on the Muasher doctrine. As long as people are quiet, everything's under control, it's fine. During the Eisenhower administration, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles summed up the dominant view amongst American strategic planners. We must regard Arab nationalism as a flood, which is running strongly. We cannot successfully oppose it, but we can put up sandbags around positions we must protect, the first being Israel and Lebanon and the second being the oil positions around the Persian Gulf. During the Cold War, the new state of Israel was perceived as an important ally in the struggle against Arab independence. And the Israelis had their own imperial ambitions. You're faced in that sense with a terrible predicament if you're going to be a Zionist, and which is that you have to conquer the land that you say God gave it to you, that God gave you, and the, the conquest would be rationalized by the sufferings that you had received and uh, the fact that you felt yourself divinely entitled to it. The Zionist movement goes back really to the beginnings of the 19th century, but it was only adopted by Jews out of a conflict and a crisis that they had towards the close of the 19th century. And that uh, set forth for the Jews a, a choice which was to develop a nationalism for themselves. Uh, it wasn't the only choice. I mean, a lot of other Jews decided 
to become very pious and, and just go to the religious traditions, or they decided to go westward and became very, very important in the history of the United States immigration, or they became very much involved with Marxist and socialist movements. But there was this also fourth impulse, which was to become uh, the bearer of an idea that they had to develop their nationalism. Ben Gurion, um, later Moshe Dayan, who was you know his chief of staff and the like, uh, said, "Listen, if I were Arab, I, <laughs> I would do everything possible to kick out the Jews. And, you know, but I'm a Jew, and we have this destiny, and we're going to take this country over." The early Zionists were interested in this, and they sent a couple of uh, scouts to study the situation, and they uh, cabled back uh, in crypto language, but it was unmistakable, uh, the following message that the bride is beautiful, but she is married to another man, and the bride being the land that they saw for themselves, and the marriage being the brute fact that there were other people living there who had, in fact, inhabited that land. In fact, these people whom we call Palestinians had, to some degree, inhabited it ever since the uh, destruction of the Jewish temple back in 70 AD. And they're probably the descendants of the original Jews. Uh, whereas the Jews who came at the end of the 19th century and through the 20th century were mainly Jews who developed in Eastern Europe or so Russian territory, such as my own family, called the Ashkenazim Jews. And we certainly had the religion, but there was no actual authentic national rootedness. And to take it over, it required ethnic cleansing. It's built into the logic. It's, it's an iron necessity. It can wax, it can wane, it can take legal forms, it can take administrative forms, it can take economic forms. And then, of course, in 1947 and 48, it took terroristic and military forms and became the great Nakba, which is the catastrophe of Palestinian existence. When 800,000 Palestinians were violently expelled, 531 villages were destroyed, the memory of those villages was erased and the like. So that's the, the foundational event, which happens to have been a, a crime, because it's a crime to take somebody else's land, and that's the essence of the matter.
the imbalance is incredible. It's 100 to 1, basically. And yet, somehow, it's, it's possible, given this kind of matrix that the history of uh, being persecuted for, you know, for being Jewish in an anti-Semitic society, all these fears of, can be uh, culled and drummed up and strident government propaganda saying, you know, we're defending the integrity of the state of Israel. So a lot of, you know, it's amazing how people can um, turn truth on its head and believe that they are in fact the, uh, you know, victim of a, of, a, of a force, namely the Palestinians. I think Palestinians have very remarkable qualities. They said chiefly being able to endure the punishment that's been meted out to them. It's incredible that they are, they are as forgiving and as as benign a people as in fact they are. I know many, many Palestinians and they are remarkable, the lack of vengeance. And of course they have their, their anger and their little sex within them and some of them will do terrible things because that's human beings. But in any sense that this is a real threat to the state of Israel, is just in the, you know, the realm of madness and delusion. All governments have to justify what they're doing. They have to become legitimate and the like. And the, more, the worse they behave, the more strenuously they have to lie and distort reality in order to be legitimate. And this is, you know, what they're doing, and they, you know, they somehow succeeded through, through a sustained propaganda campaign to uh, persuade the majority of Israeli citizens that the Palestinians were the aggressors and a genuine threat to the state of Israel, which is absolute nonsense. State-structured racism. I mean, the, the, the racism is profound, and it is necessary given the basic logic of the social compact, the basic structure of the state. So it's impossible to avoid. So not only is it unavoidable, but it's, it's inevitably going to get worse. And it is, it is getting worse all the time. There's more racism in Israel sociologically measured against the Palestinians. Uh, the IDF, the Israel Army, uh, is increasingly violent against Palestinians in, in, in all respects. And um, the situation does not resolve and it's heading towards an, an extremely calamitous outcome, though it's calamitous even in itself now. In the 21st century, an increasing number of Jews are demanding a just peace with the Palestinians. Yet the Israeli government remains committed to war and expansion. What are the roots of the war on terror as a concept? It was actually invented by Benjamin Netanyahu, who then became the Prime Minister of Israel, in 1979. Netanyahu had called a conference on um, international terrorism, and he coined the phrase international terrorism in 1979. And Bush Sr., who was then the head of the CIA, and George Shultz, who later became Secretary of State, were at this conference. At that conference, uh, Netanyahu and all of and Simon Perez and, and most of the other presenters, including Bush, proposed essentially the war on terror policies, which would characterize liberation resistance groups, anti-colonial resistance groups, as terrorists. For Netanyahu, it was the PLO. And it was Arabs and Palestinians uh, who, who were to be characterized as terrorists. For Bush, it was the Sandinistas and Allende and people in El Salvador and, and resistance fighters in Indonesia and so on. The infiltration into the Americas by terrorists, by outside interference, and those who aren't just aiming at El Salvador, but I think are aiming at uh, the whole of Central and possibly later South America and I'm sure eventually North America. It worked so well that by 1984, the second conference on international terrorism was held not in Jerusalem, but in Washington, D.C. So that was one of the first seeds of planting the idea of 
uh, characterizing Muslims and Arabs and Palestinians as terrorists. It, it's interesting, right after 9-11, um, uh, Margaret Thatcher wrote an article that crowed saying uh, Islam is the new Bolshevism. After the Soviet Union collapsed, the U.S. had a problem. They couldn't justify the massive military spending and the imperial controls and the bases and things, and the American people were clamoring for a peace dividend. In 1992, shortly after the Soviet Union collapsed and Bush Sr. was now president, he set up the DPG group, the Defense Policy Guidance Group, to come up with strategies for making the United States a permanent empire in the world giving it permanent control. Dick Cheney was leading it, and Rumsfeld and Powell came up with two conflicting, two alternate uh, scenarios. Rumsfeld's was selected. It was basically proposed taking over the Middle East and the Caspian Sea area. When that one was uh, exposed by the New York Times, it became part of the reason that Bush Sr. was um, turfed out of office. It was a scandal. Shortly after that, I think in 1994-95, Azalmay Khalilzad was commissioned to write a piece under the direction of Brzezinski. He wrote this book, again, saying that the Caspian Sea area, which includes Afghanistan, and the Middle East needed, both needed to be conquered in order for the U.S. to have permanent control. And again, Khalil Zad said this would be a difficult sell to the American public and that you would need a pretext incident. It was the first time pretext incident was mentioned. What was happening at, at the same time was that the U.S. was maneuvering the Caspian Sea area, uh, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, their minerals and their natural gas especially, and also they were trying to set up U.S. bases that would ring the area and control China, India, and the Soviet and what had been the Soviet Union. In 1997, two things happened. Zbigniew Brzezinski, who had been the policy advisor under Carter, he wrote The Grand Chessboard. And this is an amazingly Machiavellian book that's really worth reading. And basically he said, if you control the Middle East and the Caspian Sea area, you control the world because basically you're in the middle of Europe and China and Africa and Asia. So Dr. Brzezinski, uh, I can't say enough about uh, his contribution to our country. Somebody who uh, has over decades trained uh, some of the most prominent foreign policy specialists, uh, not just in the Democratic Party, but uh, has trained a number uh, who ended up in the Republican Party as well. Uh, he is one of our most outstanding scholars one of our most outstanding thinkers. Uh, he has proven to be an outstanding friend uh, and somebody who I've learned an immense amount from. The last thing, of course, was the RAD, Rebuilding America's Defenses put out by the Project for the New American Century, which literally said we reaffirm the values of the Defense Policy Guidance Report and we're basically expanding it. And it laid out everything, all the major policy changes that became part of Bush's war on terror. Also in that, they said we would need a new Pearl Harbor type incident in order to sell it. The Taliban took over Kabul and established a government with and only with the support of the United States and the Saudi government. And the U.S. was actively working with them. And then the Taliban did two mistakes. One was that they destroyed the poppy fields and banned heroin. And the second thing uh, that they did was that they started demanding a fair share of the proceeds from the Unicol business. And the U.S. in July 2001, and shortly before the 9-11 attacks, told them, well, either carpet you with gold, if you agree, or we'll copy you with bombs. Shortly after that, the U.S. started amassing aircraft carriers and um, having military exercises all around Afghanistan, the biggest buildup in the Caspian Sea area in history. Prior to 9-11? Prior to 9-11, okay. in the lead-up to 9-11, so that it was possible, that's why it was possible to launch the war against Afghanistan so soon.
Vice President, Mr. Speaker, members of the Senate, and of the House of Representatives, yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Chairman Hamid Karzai. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful I see skies of blue, clouds of white, the bright blessed day, and the dark sacred night, and I think to myself, what a wonderful
colors of the rainbow are so pretty in the sky. Angels of the people, of the people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, How are you? I say.